like to call the meeting to order and welcome everyone to the Thursday, April 11, 2024 Plain Edge Board of Education meeting. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> And then we'll turn the meeting over to Dr. Selena for superintendent's comments. Good evening, everyone. A couple of great announcements to share tonight. Congratulations to Owen Donnellan for being named as one of New York's top 100 boys of course players. There's going to be a whole bunch of them that will be coming out over the probably the next three to five days. So uh, we have many of our uh, student athletes that are being mentioned inside of Newsday at this point in time. We'll be sure to be promote, promoting those. Let the community, students, and, and to acknowledge them. Planning Public Schools is proud to host the Spring Special Olympics. We had our meeting last night. Um, I have to be honest with you, I was so impressed. There were a few hundred people that showed up. Uh, I want to thank everyone that's been working so diligently on this collaborative effort between the Town of Oyster Bay and the Plain Edge Public Schools. Uh, we have over 350 years, and after last night's meeting, people went home and told their friends, and now we have more people that are applying. So we're happy. We're going to need everybody. So please keep, keep signing up. Uh, congratulations to our high school students on their hard work and dedication to a box. They competed at the first competition, Hofstra, on 324 and 325. Congratulations to Devin Downs of being a high school sophomore All-American, placing fourth at the Virginia Beach Nationals. We invite all plaintiffs community members to join us celebrating our first state championship team, Varsity Wrestling, on April 16th at 7 p.m. in Plaintiffs High School Gymnasium. It's being advertised as we speak. Come see the Plains High School Drama Club perform Footloose, the musical, on April 18th and 19th at 7 p.m. And April 20th, 1 and 7 p.m. tickets can be purchased at phsdrama.booktix.com. Congratulations to senior Sydney Lynn for being selected to New Zealand's All Long Island Cheerleading First Team and to senior Sophia Asenmacher for being selected to New Zealand's Second Team. Plains 5K Walk Run will be held this Sunday, April 14th. Um, Robot Connection, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. D. Paola to please speak for a moment about this very interesting opportunity for our students and give us a little background on it. So this Saturday, we will be hosting our annual Student Robot Earth Day Connection event at the Brian Moore Athletic Center on Saturday morning. Every year, we do it to celebrate Earth Day, and our students get to code their way through all different activities uh, that is related to Earth Day. And you can see the different stations here. Some of them are the are similar from previous years and some are brand new ones because as our interests of our students change, uh, the teachers go and change up the stations to uh, meet their needs. And this year it was very exciting to hear that our fifth graders who did it when they were in third grade actually reached out to the STEAM teachers as well as their parents so they could be the coaches this year because when they were in third grade, so we have third graders, uh, experiences mm -hmm. event. our fifth graders are coaches and we usually have high school students from robotics this year unfortunately well fortunately but unfortunately uh the, our students are going at the high school going to be in disney world at the music um competition so they will not be able to help but this year we are able to ask eighth graders to also be the coaches with the fifth graders so it really is a true district experience for our students and we are looking forward to it and even last night a parent came up to one of the steam teachers and said, is it too late? Can my daughter be one of the coaches? Because uh, they found out that their other friends were doing it. So it's a great day. We invite the parents back at 12. So the parents get to drop their student, their children off and they do all these uh, events. And then at 12 o'clock, they're invited back to have a slideshow. And there is a little competition during the day. So then they do get awards as well. So we invite you to come and see it. Uh, the board, you are welcomed at any time during that time. And then the other part is from 12 to 12.30 where the parents are. Sorry. That's outstanding. If you haven't seen it before, it's definitely something to see. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the Board of Education members of the Plains Community, before closing out on the superintendent's remarks this evening, I'd like to make a few comments about a pattern of negative behaviors I'm observing with a super minority of the online community that are speaking from a position of not knowing the facts. And in effect, spreading the truth about our schools, our incredible teachers, and the families of the children we serve every day. Let's not forget to me mention the great reputation of the Plain Edge Public Schools. I realize, among other cherished values in this country, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. And people can write most anything they want on social media. 
but I cannot sit idly by and witness the public be told on truthful information by select individuals who are speaking negatively of our schools and the district as a whole. The Board of Education and many amazing teachers and support staff without the facts and perhaps for their own personal benefit. I want to be clear, the distribution, the distribution of negative and ill-informed misinformation is hurting the plans community and our outstanding reputation of being an amazing place to live, learn, work, and raise a family. I most recently heard from members of our community that are concerned about the potential of negative impact to their home values as a result of what's being posted and the negative light it paints our district. I want to tell these individuals to please stop your negative postings <clears throat> about our schools that are inaccurate and most inappropriately depicting us. As you may be aware, this administration in collaboration with the board have implemented numerous award-winning programs, facility improvements, and opportunities for our children to thrive in a global economy. But I also remind you that many students graduate from our high school programs with 20 to 40 college credits, enter prestigious colleges, trade schools, and the military every year. Disparaging statements made by select individuals who choose to speak negatively about the success of our children who graduate from planets is unfortunate and ill-informed. While I will not speak about any specific child in a public meeting, I can share recent con uh, comments about the graduation rate of the class of 2023 was, quote, disappointing. Clearly not considering that with the changes in recent laws, children of special needs have a legal right to participate in our schools until the age of 22. Now that does not mean that every child that did not graduate last year was a special needs child, but I can share that there were quite a few. If they had contacted me to discuss their concerns, I would have enlightened them to the fact we are happy that these special needs children and their families trust us with their children every day and would like the support in the coming years and are keeping their children in school. Unfortunately, they don't graduate with their official class year and it's reported to the state as a non-graduate. And yes, the rate of graduation appears to be lower than our highest expectations for every graduating class. We fully recognize that the graduation rate could be even higher for 2023, but please understand that we have and will always do what's best for children. And that drives every decision we make for the planet's community. And by the way, our graduation rate far exceeds the 2023 New York State average. Ask the right questions before bashing the schools, please. I recently read another social media post from a member of the community claiming that the capital projects that have been implemented over the last 13 years did not have community input. This individual is clearly unfamiliar with the process of how capital projects become propositions for the planet's community to vote on. The Board of Education consciously chooses on an annual basis to consider the recommendation of me, the superintendent of schools, and continues to consider the facility needs of the district with educational programs and school security being a top priority of this administration. The superintendent works with the district architect to evaluate potential school facility upgrades deciding what to recommend on an annual basis. We've done a lot of amazing improvements in our schools over the past 13 years. The fact is these schools were built in the 40s and 50s. And like our homes, you see it everywhere around you as you travel through our neighborhoods. They require modernization to meet the program needs of our children. The district strategically plans facility and security improvements, considering feedback from conversations we have professional staff, students, community members that have expressed their opinions every year about our schools. On an annual basis, the public weighs in and votes to approve the capital and security propositions on vote day in May. And might I add that over the last 13 years, every three out of four voters that step up to the voting booth or 75% of the voting community resoundingly speak their minds, state their opinions and vote their minds to approve what is being recommended by this administration and this board of education. At times, more people have actually voted for the facility and security propositions than the actual school budget. The planners community speaks loudly and clearly every year, and they make the final decisions about how they want their money spent to improve their schools, improve our programs. I'd also like to state that this board has been committed to providing appropriate, modern, and state-of-the-art facilities to build our amazing programs over the last 13 years, and have utilized capital reserves to fuel these changes to the tune of nearly 70 plus million dollars. Furthermore, the district receives as much as 60% of the capital funds we spend over the next 15 years upon completion of the project from the New York State Education Department. It creates a state aid revenue funding stream back to the district that fuels future projects 
and it introduces additional revenues for many years to come. Capital and security reserves may only be used for school improvements. This model of budgeting for capital improvement allows the district to keep the tax levy stable without spikes in taxation from our schools to modernize our and repair our aging schools. We have a minimal debt and we're not asking the community for bonds for facility improvements and incurring debt. I'll remind the community that this board has done an incredible job budgeting for the future. And in fact, over the last nine years, the tax levy for plain edge homeowners has been on average 0.97% and a few years was zero. No additional taxes were added on the years when there was zero. As a result of their positive fiscal leadership, when surrounding school districts at this time are very concerned about the status of their staff, we continue to offer low class sizes and an amazing array of programs, extracurricular programs, as well as interclassic uh, sports programs. This district receives glowing fiscal audits every year for the last 13 years from internal and external auditors. The reports are online, you can check them out. As a result, we've earned an AA2 Moody's rating. A2 is the third highest long-term credit rating that Moody assigns to high quality fixed income securities with very low credit risk. We are in the best fiscal shape of our lives and into the future. Outstanding planning by the board. In case you haven't realized it, people have really taken notice of this amazing Plain Edge community as an extraordinary place to buy a home and raise a family. And it is a result of the outstanding educational programs and modernization of our school facilities. There's a shortage of homes in Plain Edge as we speak. And when the few homes hit the market, they disappear in a moment's time. And many times for over asking price. Most recently, I've seen homes selling for as much as 1.4 million. Housing values are higher than ever before. The board continues to be fiscally appropriate, transparent and accountable. And most importantly, puts children first. Neighboring Nassau and Suffolk County schools and even universities visit our facilities here on a regular basis. LIU, Delphi, Hofstra, they come to see the things that we've built, right? whether it be our cafeteria or our state-of-the-art athletic center. As the educational leader of Planet, your superintendent, I have to mention, I was reading online, like many of you do, negative comments about our schools and our collective performance most recently on New York State tests in EIA and math. This was written by a member of the online community who's not familiar with the actual numbers. Remember, you need to understand what the numbers say when you look at those reports. When you go to the state website, you say, oh, look, the performance is not what I think it should be. Many years ago, parents in Plain Edge decided that the testing, not just here in Plain Edge, but the testing of our students and using these scores as an evaluation tool for our amazing teachers and children was not okay. And we led the county and perhaps the island in the number of children that opted out. The numbers posted on the New York State website and reported in news, they don't tell the real story of what's going on here. Since the opt-outs, since with the high number of opt-outs, it does not have statistical significance in the testing world. So when people speak out negatively about our performance, I want to enlighten you as your superintendent. Instead, I'd ask you to look at the amazing graduates from our high school who attend many prestigious universities and enter with, with as many as 20 to 40 college credits, as I mentioned previously, all earned right here in Plain Edge High School. If the person that posted this negative post only reached out, they would learn that this is the real story of test scores and not be bashing the schools again. You are hurting the reputation of the Plains Public Schools and I ask you to stop. My last observation I'd like to share today. I've seen nothing written about the amazing things that are actually going on inside of these schools every day. I only see negative posts and I don't understand why. In fact, I haven't seen one positive one in a long time. The message I'll leave you all with tonight is the following. To those negative super minority of people that are not being kind or feel the need to spread inaccurate misinformation about these schools and members of my staff, this administration, this board, my teachers, our support staff, I would highly recommend you consider my suggestion moving forward. What we ask from you is what we ask from the children and the staff every day. Be kind, be positive, build your community, and above all, stop the negative and accurate statements of our schools. You're misleading people on a daily basis. I thank you and I ask you to believe everything I ask. I thank you to our majority of super positive parents for your amazing support on a daily basis. 
Don't believe everything you hear on the street, at the fields or written online. Remember, anybody can write online. Contact me, speak with your teachers, contact your administration, right? About anything that concerns you about this community or about, I'm available always. Thank you, and this concludes the superintendent's remarks for this evening. At this time, I pass it back to the president. Thank you, Dr. Selena. Uh, we have routine approvals, approval of the minutes of the March 19th, 2024 meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the March 19th, 2024 board meeting? Ms. Townsend, second. Ms. Maggio, all in favor? Opposed? Abstaining. Okay, four in favor, two abstaining, motion passed. Right. Warrant reports, 83. 90 to 92, 94, 96 through 97, 99, and 101 through 103. Do I have a motion to approve those warrant reports? Ms. Maggio, second. Ms. Townsend, all in favor? Opposed? Abstaining. Okay, six in favor, motion passed. Treasurer's report, February 2024. Do I have a motion to approve the February 2024 Treasurer's report? Dr. Neto, second. Mrs. Fagnolo, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, six in favor, motion passed. All right, discussions and presentations. We have the final draft of the 2024 2025 budget presentation by Mr. Perazzo. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Yeah, please tell me Yeah. Okay, we find ourselves in the uh, month of April, the budget presentation. That would be the sixth month of the budget process. Um, after this meeting, we'll only have um, one more uh, budget cycle where we um, we have a budget hearing on May 9th, and then we have a uh, budget on May 21st. Tonight, we're gonna have uh, four presentations. We're gonna have the capital planning uh, update. We're gonna have fund balance and reserve plan, a revenue presentation, and this the uh, fifth um, presentation of the budget. If you recall, when we met in January, uh, our rollover budget was 105 million 969. That was a 4.7% year to year increase. When we met again on February 6th, we had reduced the budget by $563,000. Um, major reductions in that uh, month were the uh, reduction of salaries um, that we included in the federal grant. And we also reduced special education spend by uh, uh, $383,000. In March, when we met, we reduced the budget by another $717,000. If we uh, we incorporated the known retirements into the budget, replaced them with uh, estimations of where the new new teachers would start, and we reduced the contractual expenses that were budgeted in the uh, transportation budget. When we met on March 19th for our fourth draft of the budget, we reduced the budget for uh, final TRS, teachers' retirement system rates came out, and then we uh, removed, removed some teaching assistance to be paid through a UPK grant. Uh, those were the major drivers of the budget. And tonight we're happy to report that we reduced the budget by an additional $348,000. Um, we took a good look at it. After we finalized our salaries and we went back and looked at the, at the benefits that we provide to the employees, we reduced uh, ERS by $288,000. We moved some expenses that were paid out of the general fund. We moved into a grant for $156,000. And we had added back uh, previous cuts to special ed to $200,000. Um, I'm happy to report that we have, uh, we come in with a 2.83% year over year budget increase. And we wind up at 104 million 081. So the 2.83 is actually is the budget budget side of the equation. Um, that's what we're recommending. It's not the same as the tax levy. I want to be clear about that. We'll go into the tax levy in the next presentation. Um, but we're going to be recommending a 1.95% tax levy this year. And um, that's the amount that's levied from the community. And uh, the, we were, uh, the tax levy limit, as you know, was 2.22%. I believe the difference is close to $200,000 that we're not levying. And, uh, We'll go through the we'll go through the um, revenue cycle in the next presentation. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Perrazzo. Um, I actually have a question. Sure. So, um, last year's audited financial statements, if I remember correctly, the amount that was budgeted relative to actuals, I think the differential was seven million excess. Okay. So, what happens to those monies that were well, over budgeted but underspent? So, have, budget's a budget, and the budget doesn't reflect what's left over. What you really have to look at is your true revenue, the one that you put in, right. versus your true expenses. And that that number was less than half of that. So a budget, if my wife were to say that I wished I made X dollars, but I, you know, you should talk about your wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish she yeah. spent X dollars. That's a budget. That doesn't right. reflect reality. What's reality is what I made versus what I spent. And that's what you're not focusing on and you should focus on. So on the on the revenue side, and I know that's the next part. Yeah, we we I think if I recall correctly, we had maybe three million more in revenue than what we originally budgeted, right? Um, At the end of the year, no, we were under on the revenue. We didn't. There's reserves and fund balance budgeted up there. Okay. So that's what you use to balance the budget. You build your you build your expenditure side of the budget. You look at your known sources of revenue. And then the difference you have to, I don't like to use the word plug, but your right. plug number is your reserves and fund balances. And you clearly do not want that number growing year after year because it shows you your financial condition going down. Okay. So I guess, I guess what I'm trying to understand is when we look at these numbers at the end of last year, um, if I was looking at it correctly, and I, I think I was, there was definitely excess monies that were left over or that were still available at the end of last year is that yeah but i think you have to realize that if i spent every dollar in a budget i would be spending those reserves too and that's not a house you want to build because when those reserves run out we you turn there's a lot of districts that have mentioned that on the levy in, in certain years and wound up spending their reserves and those are the districts that are in fi financial distress there's quite a few of them this year. Yeah. Yep. We're talking about the appropriated reserves that, that are reflected on schedule? Yes. You really don't want to be digging into those too deep every year. Okay. Because that's 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 like buying a house you couldn't afford because you had savings in the bank, but when the savings in the bank runs out, what do you do? Thank you. Okay. All right. Now, Mr. Prazo will present the revenue budget. <clears throat> Any other questions before he continues? Okay. Okay. This is a snapshot of our uh, uh, previous budgets. Um, the actual side reflects the actual uh, revenue. Um, you can see there were certain increases, 18, 18. Uh, we had $98 million in revenue. Those had some special uh, items in it, um, some big items. Uh, there were unspent bond proceeds from the middle school uh, that were repatriated in, into the A fund, the general fund, $1.6 million. And also there was a, a, a transaction that the board entered into. It was rather significant. We had, um, we had split life insurance policies that the board had purchased for retirees years ago. And they had accumulated they had accumulated quite a large uh, cash surrender value uh, due to the interest rates they were earning in the premium in the bank, and we actually um, sold those those policies to a, an insurance company, and we uh, netted five point nine million dollars on that transaction. We never have to pay the premiums again. So that's the anomaly in, in the uh, revenue side of the budget. Um, you can see our revenue increasing uh, every year. Uh, through 22, 23 by several million dollars. Uh, 23, 24 and 24, 25 are, are still budgets because we don't know where 23, 24 will come in, but that shows the 101, 212 versus the 104, 081 budget. Um, it also shows the tax increase of 1.95% or $1.3 million increase in taxes for the year. Um, I, I just want to point out that we have some expense categories that have increased uh, uh, more than that this year so you, you know i i don't expect that we'll be getting too far ahead on the curve if not if anything i would assume that we would be going 
uh, backwards in our ability to raise revenue versus our increases in expenses year over year. Um, this shows the uh, property tax going up 1.85%, just a detailed breakdown. We have a pilot revenue, which is uh, uh, through LIPR. Uh, years ago, they took certain properties off our tax rolls and created pilots out of them. And, uh, uh, you know, that wasn't good for the community, but that's what happened. They, they, they have the, uh, they don't go up by as much as, they don't correspond to the tax increases. As a matter of fact, they typically go down uh, and they have the ability to uh, uh, protest the, the assessment on those properties. Uh, our state uh, sources are about $24 million. That's, uh, you, you know, in year, I'm showing a 2.91% increase on state sources, but um, that may or may not be um, where that comes in. That's the estimate of state revenue and the state revenue budget, budget that we receive has a lot of um, a lot of assumptions in it. It's based on projected spend, which doesn't always come in. Uh, where it is, so that number can be anywhere, as, you know, it can be half a million dollars lower than that number. Um, and we have different categories, use of money, charges for service, and miscellaneous. Um, charges for service would be monies that we take in through uh, uh, outside districts attending our school. Uses of money and property would be interest income, and then miscellaneous is just everything else that falls under the mm -hmm. under use of money and charges for service. This year, we're appropriating uh, reserves and fund balance totaling $4.7 million. That's up slightly from last year. It shows the total budget of 104 down at the bottom, which corresponds to the first page. This page shows the reserves that we're appropriating to the budget, workers' compensation, teacher retirement system, employees' retirement system, and employee benefits. Which is my cat. What? Turn that off. Yes. Sorry, everybody. Just might not be gonna take a break for a second. Good. Sorry. Good. Thank you. This is a graphic representation of the sources of revenue we have uh, for the last three years. You can see that the biggest source of revenue is uh, property taxes. That's sixty-seven point two nine percent of our budget. Uh, the state provides us with a little over twenty-three percent, and our reserves and fund balance are four point five five percent in this graph. Um, the numbers don't really deviate much. Uh, last year, the property taxes were sixty-seven point eight seven percent of the budget. It's gone down slightly, and the year before it was uh, less than that. And that's the question. The revenue side. Any questions? Anybody? Okay. All right, and now we'll move on to. Did you do district fund balance? You did? Nope. No. All right, so we're going to move to district fund balance and reserve plan, which is the next set. <clears throat> We're just gonna take a look at our reserves and the trend of our reserves in this presentation. Um, as you can see over the years, our reserve balances have gone down. Um, looks like we were close to $35 million uh, in 2019 and currently we're at about 20, $27 million. Um, the restricted, when we talk about restricted reserves, um, restricted reserves are reserves that they call restricted because they're only to be used for uh, the intended purpose of the reserve. We have various reserve. We have a teacher's retirement system reserve. We have employees retirement system reserve. We have a uh, EBLOR reserve. And we can talk about those a little bit as we go through the presentation. But you can see the downward trend in the reserves uh, that we have. This next slide details um, the specific reserves. On the side, when we talk about on assigned fund balance in the top line, that is the that is typically four percent of the subsequent year's budget that we're allowed to keep for the reserve. Sometimes they refer to that as a rainy day reserve. Um, we've used that reserve 
twice over the last five years. Uh, we used it to fund our expenses that were related to COVID. And then uh, another time we used it to settle some litigation that was that was uh, out there. Um, so we, those reserves do come in handy when you need them. Um, the unappropriate fund balance is, is monies from one year to the other that are carried over into the subsequent year's budget. You have commitments in the prior year that you haven't uh, paid for yet. They come over into the next year's budget, reserving those funds uh, to pay those expenditures. And then we have the assigned fund balance uh, um, that we appropriated fund balance that we had talked about that we use to uh, balance the budget. These are, this is a list of the uh, other reserves, what we call the, um, the restricted reserves. You have the uh, capital improvements, employees EBAR, which we call employee benefit accrued liabilities, you have the TRS, the uh, ERS reserve, unemployment and workers' compensation. So we went from $35 million in 2019 down to $28 million in 2023. Um, this is a stacked graph of, of, of uh, where the reserves are and what they are. Um, difficult to, really, to uh, read in, given the colors. Um, the largest part of these uh, stacked graph would be capital um, on the sign and retirement contribution reserve. And this goes into detail as to what the purpose of the reserve is. The retirement contribution reserve is the teacher's retirement contribution that's TRS on an annual basis we make contributions to uh, um, make contributions to the retirement system um, the rate is that we contribute is set by the state based on actual real assumptions and uh, we have the TRS and the ERS contribution reserve the EBLAR reserve um, which has about four million dollars that that's a calculation that we do every year based on your sick leave and, and vacation time that's due to an employee upon termination, uh, a little over four million dollars in there. We have the unemployment reserve. That's uh, that's for uh, payments made to claimants. Uh, we're self-insured in that area. We have workers' compensation reserve. That's another area where we're self-insured, and we have a little, we have about a million dollars. That's another actuarial valuation uh, where they tell us what our maximum funding should be, and we always try to come in uh, at that number. Uh, then we have the two capital reserves that are out there, and um, I think as Dr. Selena alluded to before, when we fund the reserve, uh, the board the board decides which reserves to fund at the end of the year. Uh, money goes into the reserve. It's not until the community approves the project that the budget vote that monies come out of those funds. And uh, as you'll see in Dr. Selena's presentation. There's about $2.4 million available and 2.7 uh, uh, available in the capital reserve for. Thank you, Pete. And that's it. Questions? Any questions? No, that's Thank great. You. Thank okay. you, Mr. Pritchard. All right, and now finally, <clears throat> planning for our children's future, capital update with capital proposition, Dr. Selena. As I shared earlier, we have a lot of exciting things that are going on in the community. We'd like to do an update on that, um, let people know where we are. I'd also like to remind people that the state operates at about 24 weeks behind. Um, so someone says, what does that mean? Well, I think there's three people up in the state at Albany that yeah. review these projects. Um, they've been seriously understaffed for the last 20 years, and there's been no changes in that, although as an organization of superintendents in Nassau County and Suffolk County, as well as Nassau Suffolk School Boards, we've petitioned them and asked them to please add more people so that we could get these projects done. By the time we actually put these capital propositions up, some of them could take two to four years in order for them to get through the channels and to actually be completed. Some of them move more swiftly than others, depending on what they are and what, what we're asking for. Um, but here's where we are today. Um, status update. <clears throat> Okay. Status update of our facilities, uh, high school fitness center. Um, actually, the, the kids entered into it um, this week. Um, they'll actually be experiencing our physical education classes, uh, as well as our teams. It'll be open to starting next week on uh, Monday, but definitely will be in full use 
uh, after the upcoming recess for those people that are taking off and celebrating. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, and we, we also, um, this will be open to the community starting in the summer of uh, 2024. So uh, people will be able to get a gym membership. They'll be able to use our online app. They'll be able to come and work out. Um, we'll be collaborating with um, the Schwartz Institute, uh, who is our physical trainer for the district. And um, Bill Schwartz is a good friend to the district and we'll be working with his people as well uh, in order to uh, do strength training for our teams and answer questions for the public as well. Uh, middle school theater upgrade, that's complete. Uh, the lighting in there, they saw the project that we did at the high school and Brian Smith called me up immediately. He's like, we, you know, we, ours, are, ours are old now, so we, we, we need to, you know, these are the things that we need in order to make our program be amazing. And if you had a chance to see the latest show, you'll understand why. Uh, Brian and his staff are quite passionate about this. Um, project facilities for 21-22, uh, <coughs> high school stream, advanced research center, still in design phase, uh, summer 25, East Plain gymnasium uh, air conditioning. That was one area in each one of our schools that the public approved, all three elementary schools. Um, you'll see that this is complete. Uh, John H. West is complete, Schwarting. Um, and people, uh, had a parent ask me the other day, you know, what, what's taking so long? I mean, can't you just put the air conditioning in? Well, if we could get the equipment, we definitely put the air conditioning in. And, um, we've changed manufacturers twice. Um, we're, we're comfortable with the manufacturers to meet the specifications. Engineers have already cross-referenced that for us. Um, and the, the equipment is loaded and being configured as we speak in the last school, which will be the short engine. Um, Power upgrade, uh, generator installations, so that, you know, we, this place will be uh, emergency ready. This entire facility uh, is at New York State Education Department today and uh, will make us a uh, emergency status center for the communities. That, should there ever be any type of uh, need for a uh, hurricane or power outage, et cetera. So we'll be able to uh, shelter people here. We'll be able to offer showers. Um, so we're excited about having that. Uh, it doesn't disrupt business for us. Um, High school softball field was complete, and that was uh, last fall. <laughs> music, um, so the music wing renovation project. Um, I actually just met with the teachers, and we finalized the design. Design process for these projects involves staff. All right, we start with our architects. We take a look at the priorities of the program, what we're looking to do. This will actually add an additional room, which has been sorely missed. Mr. Lakes has been quite a sport since I got here about 13, 14 years ago now, and he's worked off of the stage, but the truth of the matter is it's not acoustically appropriate for a choral program. He does an amazing job with those kids, but these spaces will be renovated and there will be an additional uh, extension of the building that will be put off towards the south on the edge. If you're familiar with looking at the front entrance of the high school, will be on the right-hand side. So we're very excited. The teachers are totally amped for this and looking forward to this happening. Um, and they finalized with me just actually yesterday. Um, staff bathrooms started in the winter of 2024 that the, the, the actual public and they're in the final phases now. High school student bathrooms are complete. Uh, student uh, bathrooms at Schwartinger are complete. Uh, hallway and cafeteria over John H. West was also. Uh, John H. West uh, turf upgrade project that recently was approved by the state. We expect that to start. Um, oh, go right ahead, please. Um, high school gym, it starts in the summer. So how long will that take? Well, I am opening up September with a gym one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So we, we are, uh, so we have already, um, placed the longest lead time item are bleachers. Bleachers can be 16 to 20 weeks. Um, we've already ordered the bleachers at this point in time. Um, and we have the other, um, trades are lined up for this. So we expect it to start the day after reading this examination uh, at the high school. So that entire hallway that's outside there, which is basically where the trainer's offices and our teacher's offices are, uh, as well as the gymnasium, my expectation is it'll be ready for the fall. All right, I'm looking to open with it. And, you know, obviously that's a lofty goal, but my expectation is, you know, we have a lot of athletic opportunities that happen in there with this plastic sports. We need to be ready for it. So they'll be working on it the day after readings are over. John H. West Field, we'll go back to this for a second. Thank you for the question. John H. West Field Turf Upgrade Project. Um, actually, that uh, is scheduled to start 
Uh, we'll be uh, finalizing that date uh, with the, the firm. It'll be sometime in June will be the start date. Um, as soon as we get that, we'll be sharing that with everyone. Uh, Library media. So I just had the pleasure of this week meeting with East Plain, John H. West, Schwarting, middle school administrators and teachers. And they saw the preliminary designs that were recommended. They have given their professional feedback about the designs. Uh, there have been, uh, there are modifications that are being made at this point in time. We'll be revisiting that again with the staff and the administration of those buildings. And we'll be going out to bid for those. So you'll see those bids will be going on to the street. Estimated timeline, seven to 10 weeks for that. And then we have to figure out timelines for actually when we can do the work to introduce the least disruption to the schools. Our current reserves, as was shared by Mr. Perazzo earlier, was capital reserve facilities was 2.7. Uh, capital reserve safety and security is 2.4. Um, we have recommendations for the, uh, the board and for the public to consider um, for this coming year. As we continue to upgrade our facilities, um, the middle school turf field is my next recommendation. It's a multi-sport field. Um, high school tennis courts, if you're a pickleball player or a tennis player, you'll know that we have some large canyons out there that uh, we've continued to fill. <coughs> Um, and they have not been done in almost 20 years now. So that's up uh, and that's up for schedule. Uh, that's scheduled for next year. We have some more bathroom upgrade in the elementary schools. We also, the nurses uh, office uh, offices need to be modernized and upgraded as well. So that's inside of it. That's for the facility specifically, the recommendations for the board as well as for the community ultimately to consider for the following school year. High school tennis courts, security lighting, so there'll be lighting out there, uh, similar to the lighting that's on the uh, football field. Um, so uh, that, that's scheduled in here. Um, you know, we've been streaming video now for probably about seven years out of that. And we've had an amazing number of tens of thousands of people have watched our shows, whether it be a concert or a performance of our children. Um, it's old. Uh, uh, the new systems are out. It needs to be upgraded. The, the cameras are grainy. We've had some complaints over the past six months. I've worked with uh, Mr. Kevin White, who basically has an incredible crew of students that take their jobs very seriously from TV and video production. Um, we'll be upgrading that system to a 4K system as a recommendation. <clears throat> About 11 years ago, 12 years ago, we started school security. You know, uh, school security is something we take very seriously. You actually heard us speak about it a short time ago in this public meeting, um, actually last month. Uh, the system itself is about 11 years old now. Um, there's a number of new additions that have come out, new products. Uh, we'll be doing a new integrated system. Uh, it'll, it'll actually provide more local control to teachers and administrators in order to actually activate lockdowns. There'll be vague detection inside of our um, restrooms. Um, the security at the, at the classroom level, uh, wearable notification systems, um, teachers will be able to initiate, you know, and signal the office and notify security if they ever need help. Uh, so they'll be able to initiate that from their badge. Um, we'll also be looking at um, uh, additional uh, speakers, uh, strobes, LED uh, clocks, uh, and communication systems update. And that's for all schools, actually. Um, it's time for us to continue to do what we've done before, which is to make sure that we offer um, very secure schools and we give our teachers and our administrators uh, the ability to communicate better uh, with our administration and, and our security systems. So that's uh, for all of our schools here. Uh, we'll also be looking at some electrical upgrades inside of our elementary schools. Um, we also have John H. West Field Security and Privacy Screening that's in this. And we have district-wide uh, security. Remember, some of our systems are 12 years old. You know, we're upgrading cameras, access control on a regular basis at this point. Uh, you know, the, the district a short time ago actually automated all the doors in all schools. Uh, we continue to provide door access and uh, video uh, access control uh, from all of our offices here. So we continue to do that. Um, when we talk about that recommendation, that totals about uh, 2.3 million. Um, the total cost recommended for the public's approval in the board is $5,030,000 to be presented for voter approval on May 21st. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a kind of an overview of where we are, 
when uh, when it's all said and done after uh, working on these projects here, we'll have one hundred and forty seven thousand nine hundred sixty eight dollars left. Um, and I'm, I'll take any questions at this time that the board may have. In terms of like selecting these items, how, how does that happen? I guess. Uh, which, which items are you speaking about? In terms of like deciding that, for example, we're going to do the lighting at the high school tennis courts. Like, how does that come to fruition? Like what's. What's the genesis of that oh, okay. coming about? The process? Yeah, I described yeah. it earlier. I'll talk to you about it. Uh, so there's a five-year architectural plan that, that is actually required by every school district. So that's one of the indicators that we use to take a look at things that need to be done infrastructure-wise. We also take a look at the uh, what the demands are of the educational programs and the interscholastic sports programs and obviously what the community is looking at as well. Um, the tennis courts <laughs> themselves came uh, uh, I've been asked by parents uh, of tennis, and I've been maybe even accused of ignoring the tennis crew uh, yeah. or students that play tennis. Um, the drain, there's no not appropriate drainage there. It floods. Um, cracks. There, there's, there, there are large cracks. So we prioritize those items as we go across. Uh, it basically look. I look at when we look at fields and when we look at exterior that you're speaking about. I look at the number of people that it services. I look at safety as a primary concern, and that's how that happens. Yeah, I mean, that's a former varsity tennis player here. We had those problems then. So we're getting rid of the drainage problems. So yeah, we have cracks and, and uh, puddles too, but we got a lot of pickleball uh, players get now. old and you know, they get beaten up. So um, nearly 20 years now with with respect to the security line, has there been like security issues at the tennis courts that, you know, I mean, we have to spend almost it was uh, here 275. That's actually that. playing level lights as well. So besides okay. the security for recording purposes, which allows us to record with ample lighting, it also allows the community and our students to play uh, when the light, especially in the fall months, uh, becomes uh, quickly uh, unavailable. So we'll be able to run it similar to any of our facilities out here. We're looking to extend the day. We're looking to offer the community as well as our uh, primarily our uh, uh, first, our educational and scholastic sports programs. We're looking to elongate that day so we can get as many people as possible to use what they pay for. And then the, the one last thing I know, obviously, is a focus on security. Um, and you had mentioned before that people could use the gym from the community. I guess my only concern would be, you know, we have students constantly on this campus from all age groups. Do we really want people coming onto school property and actually having access to our buildings? If they don't really need to be there, meaning there's not a sporting event, there's not something that is actually happening. Like to me, that would seem to be a security concern. Would be something that I wouldn't really be in favor of. Mm -hmm. How how do we mitigate that risk if we're going to have people coming to use the weight room or the fitness center? I should say. Sure, I could talk to that. So we've been researching this. The board probably about five years ago visited uh, Buffalo University, SUNY at Buffalo, where they had an open program there, and we looked at a number of different things: cafeteria. We looked at their athletic facilities and the vision of the board and continues to be, you know, uh, spoken about, which we're talking about tonight was, you know, two thirds of our population don't have children in the schools here today. So many times people say, you know, I pay a lot of taxes to live here in the plain edge community. You know, um, we allow the public to enter our fields on a regular basis. I will tell you that there are districts that the moment school is over, they lock their facilities up. And they're not available. You can't just walk onto their tracks. You can't just walk onto their fields. So what ends up happening is that, you know, people ask good questions like, why can't I? So the reason why most districts don't do what we do, and we're not most districts, is the liability associated with somebody entering into the premises and actually walking the track or playing tennis on the courts. When it's not being used for schools, they lock it down. We're not interested in doing that. The board originally promised, and you know, we, we can stay to our initial promise, <laughs> we wanted you to explore what is the liabilities associated with this, who will get access, lots of big questions. So that facility specifically that we're talking about was designed and is designed for first primarily student access during the school day, uh, after school. Uh, but I will tell you, I'm here many days, sometimes seven days a week, the building lies idle, all right? There's nobody in the building, all right? So if we were to appropriately staff it, provide supervision, create memberships where a person will get an ID card, 
We have door access controls. They will not be able to freely walk in off the street to come inside of this building just to take a walk around and take a look. That core down there has steel doors that basically will be locked so that it restricts those people to the one hallway that's actually on the east end of this corridor here. You will not be able to gain access to that area except if you have a membership. Membership will be for high school students and people that are Plain Edge residents. We will run sex offender scans on anyone that chooses to take a membership to come to the gym to be sure that we're, we are not giving people permission with a card to gain access to our facilities. Um, there will be student workers as well as adults present. Um, so I think that the security plan, and let's also mention that after consultation with uh, council as well as NICER, who is our insurance agent, they did make suggestions you know, for us to consider, but obviously to make sure we're running a safe environment. As far as the liability, um, there's no more liability uh, introduced. There's no additional fees introduced as far as our insurance rates. We were part of what we call, and we did this the first year I came, we were self-insured at one point in time for our insurance, which was, I couldn't understand, we, I, it's irrelevant. We moved to the insurance reciprocal because it's many school districts in New York State that share that load. Um, the only time you, you, you run the risk is obviously when someone gets hurt. Um, so I think that we have a great plan. We're going to go slow at first. You know, people are like, you know, when can I come? And I said, we're going to move very slowly. There'll be an app. You are announced. You must have. There are loads. We'll be controlling the number of people. On the second floor alone, there are 40 pieces or 40 stations of equipment plus five additional mirrors. So we will actually uh, go to that capacity initially, and then we're going to adjust it. And we're going to, you know, uh, Mr. Burke has his work cut out for himself as far as moderating the flow in there. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. We want to stay to our word. We want to deliver a safe environment for the community uh, to come. There'll be lockers that will be available in there. There's a small changing room that's at, uh, located at the main entrance. Uh, you can lock up your, uh, whether you be a student or not, you'll be able to lock up your, uh, any of your belongings if you would like. Uh, so I think that we're doing something that's been done before, by the way. Um, I spoke to a district that's close to Niagara Falls. Um, a much larger district uh, spanning uh, about 700 miles. Um, they shared with us basically some of the challenges that they experienced. So we're not going to fall into those pitfalls uh, because they shared them with us. And I also believe there was uh, three other districts in Long Island that had tried similar, but I don't know if they put the time and energy into designing an app, going with mind and body online, which is one of the largest gymnasium uh, private gym uh, apps that the district will brand and will be ours and we'll post it in the Apple store as well as Google Play. So we're going to move real slow. We're going to get people in. We're going to look to offer additional adult education. I believe it's going to be a safe, secure environment where people are operating under you know, supervision. Um, I actually have one last thing. With respect to turf, I mean, I've, I'm not an expert or a health specialist, but oh. um, I did look at like the New York State Department of Health study on turf and there's some things in there when you read it that i think is particularly concerning especially when it comes to um you know the well-being of the kids obviously i don't think we're looking to sure harm them um but i think one of the things that obviously stands out um that is indisputable is the fact that there's obviously heat stress potentially from <clears throat> using turf versus natural gas i mean not natural grass um the thing is obviously catastrophic injuries and i know that you know we've seen some catastrophic injuries related to um high school sports that have happened on turf fields um i think there's been a few this year uh there's also and it's inconclusive the carcinogenic compounds that can be found potentially in turf mm -hmm. and that's that's not definitive i know the u.s federal government and california mm -hmm. are investigating that as well as new york state I guess the concern I have is, you know, <coughs> we're talking about turfing another field. Um, and, you know, I think turf looks great. I mean, I coach football uh, for Bobcats and, you know, my son plays on lacrosse. It's sort of my daughter's playing those actually lacrosse fields. But um, this move to turf, I, I, my concern is that there's not enough information to deploy such a playing field without additional studies being done mm -hmm. to ensure it's actually safe. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that 
somehow we got I can speak to some of them if you'd like. I've been yeah, studying absolutely. fields now for a number of years. Mm -hmm. So we use encapsulated granules. Yeah. So, and the reason we chose encapsulated was basically is that uh, some of the things you're talking about, such as carcinogenics, mm -hmm. right? So we use specifically on our fields here, uh, not just us, Town of Oyster Bay uses the same as well in their fields. But we use the encapsulated version of that. So that uh, reduces the risk, you know, for carcinogenic. Uh, and yes, the studies are still out there. Uh, and may never be completed. And may never be completed, actually. But uh, over 90% of the schools in Long Island today have uh, turf fields. Uh, colleges have moved to turf fields. We continue to, um, one of the things that turf fields does afford us the opportunities, it provides appropriate drainage. It provides more uh, playing time. Um, the work hasn't changed for our work staff. You know, there's still a lot of maintenance associated with it. It's different type of maintenance. Um, they had to be trained. Um, we had to speak with our coaches about, you know, obviously water breaks, stress breaks. Um, and, you know, we are very conscious of, you know, what the turf is. The turf is an enabler for us in order for us to extend the school day, extend the use of our fields, and provide additional opportunities for the community when it's not being utilized. So we will continue to monitor those things that you're speaking about. And yes, it is inconclusive at this point in time. The industry is moving to almost exclusively turf fields at this point. There are some natural ones that are out there. We've looked at them. Uh, the reality is, is that it doesn't seem to be catching on too, too fast, mm -hmm. uh, such as wood, wood, wood particles, et cetera, or plastic. Uh, people look to avoid that, and I get, I understand it, but I understand your concerns. And I just, I want to say too that you know, turf, it's a very big business. I, I just saw a presentation Sunday when, uh, at the conference, and they showed the different samples of turf and also the how how it's colorized and exactly how it would be installed. So it was really interesting. But you know, it, it's it's also like a selling point. You know, what will what will be what will be used as the best equipment on those fields for the safety of children. And the, the people who have the specific company, they seem to be, again, trying to answer the questions that you just asked and also what Dr. Selena just said. Um, it was interesting to see the samples that they showed because again, if you're walking or running on that turf, you know, how does that affect you? Some and, of the things uh, to think about is, yeah, is, there was is a the, lot. The, the appropriate maintenance of the fields. Many accidents are happening in specifically high schools today because the maintenance that they're currently doing on those fields, mm -hmm. there's matting that occurs, yeah. right? You know, our people work those fields on a weekly basis, right? They have to be fluffed up for lack of a better term. The pellets need to be spread. We bought all that equipment and we trained our people to do that. Uh, <clears throat> and they continue to tell us that, you know, and I ask them all the time, that's one of the things that I think has been most important is that, you know, do you need anything? We brought in the people that installed the field to train them. Um, so, and we do impact testing on those fields regularly, right? They have to be done every year in order to certify, right? So we bring an outside company and that's an evaluator of the field to be sure for shop um, that basically if there were, you know, there has to meet the guidelines of the national standards. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, this is anecdotal. Um, my wife tore ACL skiing. So she's at PT pretty regularly. A majority of the people who are there are actually young high school athletes. Mm -hmm. And in the PT's professional opinion, that's really related to two reasons. One is specialization in a particular sport and over usage. The other one is the um, expansion of turf fields. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, and, and they're mostly girl athletes, actually. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's because of physiological reasons or whatnot, <laughs> but he's indicated that, you know, that's a lot of his clients are actually high school athletes. Um, so again, that's that's part of my concern with turf and yes, this move to it. And it is big business. Sure. Um, you know, I'm not looking to line the pockets of sports companies. Sure. Either, but um, as long as these things have been considered, um, you know, I'm happy. Well, it's a work in progress. First of all, I tell you all the time when we uh, implement something, we monitor it. Uh, we look for patterns of uh, injury. And if it's something we need to address, we will definitely address it. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beverly. Dr. Selena, can I just end this conversation on a positive note? Okay. Because I have quite a few friends that live in uh, Massapequa, and I've gotten so many calls recently with flag football. They play plain edge, and they don't stop talking about how awesome our facilities are, which is funny because a lot of times people are comparing us to Massapequa for different reasons, mm -hmm. and they're starting to say how 
you know, how amazing it is up here. So that's, you know, so, it's nice to get that from neighboring districts, I think. So Superintendent Mass Peak was, uh, was a student of mine once back in graduate school back in the day. He's a good, he's, he, I consider him to be a good colleague and a friend. So Bill says I make his life hard. Um, <laughs> you know, when he's, uh, I tell him, I said, it's not hard. I said, it just enables you to do your job better. I said, because you get to aspire. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, they're asking lots of questions over there. What about us? You know, what about this? What about this for our community? You know, we're larger than they are. Why don't we have these things? And I get it, mm -hmm. right? But they have to do the appropriate planning. The board needs to uh, budget appropriately and the community needs to be on board on a regular basis. And they are. It's an amazing community. My parents used to live down there behind St. Rose. So, uh, I, and my brother went to those schools. So it's an amazing place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I know that a lot of people are very excited about the tennis courts because they, they were asking about, you know, is that going to be fixed? Because they do want to go out and they, it might be after work. So like seven, yeah. eight o'clock, if there's lighting. There'll be, yeah, there'll also be lines for pickleball because, you know, it's the hottest thing in the world. Yeah, that's so, a big thing. Which we're excited they're about. They're excited. We have about. a lot of pick, pickleballers <laughs> now in, in the world. So we're excited about that. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Perrazzo and Dr. Selena for providing the board with an overview of our fiscal soundness and proposed 2024-2025 school budget and capital improvement plan. At this time, I would like to ask the district clerk to read business item number one, adoption of the 2024-2025 budget and record the roll call vote. Whereas the proposed school district budget for the 2024-2025 school year has been prepared by the Board of Education and whereas due notice will be given of a public hearing which will be held on the proposed budget on May 7, 2024, it is resolved that the estimated expenses of the Plain Ed Junior Free School District as set forth in the proposed budget and the property tax report card in the amount of $104,081,405 <clears throat> is hereby approved. Copies thereof shall be made available at each school building, district office, and public library. A proposition for the approval thereof shall be presented to the school district voters at the annual meeting of the school district on May 21, 2024. The question of adoption of the foregoing resolution was duly put to a vote of the roll call, which resulted as follows. Mr. Beirudi. Yes. Mrs. Maggio. Yes. Dr. Nadian. Yes. Dr. Neto. Yes. Mrs. Spagnolo. Yes. And Mrs. Townsend. Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve business items number two through 15? Ms. Townsend, second. Dr. Neto, all in favor? Opposed? Abstain. Six in favor, motion carried. Okay, pride and place. This is the opportunity for board members to present on attendance or participation at school and or community events. Um, Go ahead, Joe. You. Go ahead. Um, yeah. um, so I was able actually to attend the boys varsity lacrosse game against William Floyd with my son. It was actually a pretty cold night. It was one of the earlier games, I would say. Um, but, you know, even though it was cold, you felt warm in your heart because we got the W, which is always a nice thing. Um, I also went to see the uh, production of Matilda by the middle school, and um, it was actually a phenomenal performance. I, I mean, it was very impressive in terms of the work <clears throat> put into it, especially by uh, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Edwab. Um <clears throat> They uh, really sounded amazing, the singing, the acting, uh, the set itself, and I liked also the fact that there was a level of collaboration with the robotics team where they kind of made um, like an object fly, like a cup fly. Um, so I spoke to Mr. Smith about how he did that. So I, I know a little magic trick now, which is uh, helpful. And then this was kind of raised yesterday, but we had the uh, orientation for volunteers for the Special Olympics. I attended here in high school on Mrs. Honeyman's team. Um, but you could, you could definitely feel the excitement about that coming to Plain Edge and um, looking forward to volunteering that day uh, in Olympic Village. So people are around and they want to say hi, I'll be I'll be working in Olympic Village. So very cool. I 
also was going to speak of about Matilda and every production. I'm always mm -hmm. amazed, but the drone blew my mind. <laughs> like I was. Even with a secret though. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't everybody know it was on? <laughs> what? <laughs> but the, sorry. <laughs> well, that was transparency. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kids all told me it was a drone. I'm like, but I don't understand. So everything we're doing is... I'm sorry. I'm not <laughs> saying you're going to follow the guys. I think it's funny. I mean, everything we're teaching the kids, they're putting into everything. Fucking <laughs> drone. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then the arts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, don't know. I didn't know how it worked. I was like, I don't see a string. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, maybe I'm embarrassing myself. No, you're not. No, you're not. We're just playing. Sorry, I, I was wondering no, why. Kidding. <laughs> yeah, so it was. I'm very excited for Footloose now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Coming up. It's going to be. And, and uh, Edwina, uh, Johnny H. West, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Tomorrow night. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Anyone else? Okay. Uh... Informational reports, any questions on informational reports? An opportunity for public comment. All comments are directed to the Board of Education president. Each speaker is limited to two minutes in total. Each speaker is expected to use the microphone and clearly state their name. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Craig Fuchs, president, Planning Federation of Teachers. Good to see everyone tonight. Uh, I want to quickly talk about two things. Uh, first, I want to echo uh, Dr. Selena's sentiment uh, about what he said about the negative comments that have been posted to social media. Um, we have 290 teachers in the community. We have about 60 TAs who every day dedicate their lives to the children on Plain Edge. They work so hard. They go above and beyond every day, staying late, coming early, coming on the weekends, <clears throat> volunteering many times not for extra pay. And furthermore, about 20% of our educators are actually members of the Planners community, which is actually pretty unusual. Um, we have a very high percentage of our teachers and TAs who actually live in Plain Edge. So when you say negative things about them, you're saying negative things about your own community. And it's really disheartening. They work way too hard um, to, to experience such negative rhetoric. Remember, these are the people who spend more time with your children than perhaps some of the parents in the community spend with their children. So please be mindful of that when you're making such disparaging remarks about education and planage. It hurts. And I know that the 350 people that I represent mm -hmm. take that very personally. Um, secondly, I want to talk about the questions about finances of the Planage Public Schools. Um, I won't, I won't name the district that I live in, um, but when I walk into my daughter's elementary school, I feel like I'm walking back into 1950. The facilities are incredibly outdated. Um, the, the amount of effort and energy that's gone into keeping Planned Public Schools at the leading front of all areas is amazing. For the last 10 years, even more, um, the, the projects that this district has push forward through the leadership of Dr. Selena and the, and the Board of Ed has, has put it at the forefront of education. And um, I think that's something that needs to be uh, known by the community. Um, the district that I live in uh, has had to put up budgets because of very poor um, planning uh, about 10 to 15 years ago. In the very recent years, we've had to pierce the tax cap. I had to pay... 4.5% more. Um, every year, the district that I live in puts up budgets that are at the tax cap because they've made very poor financial decisions. And that means my taxes have gone atrociously. Um, I've had bonds passed that I'm going to have to pay if I live in the community interest on for the next 30 years. The, the decisions that district that this Board of Ed and, and Dr. Selena's team have made are unbelievable. I mean, the last 10 years, we've had an average of less than 1% tax increase. That's phenomenal. And we've maintained all the programs that we've had. 
I can't tell you how lucky we are here in Plain Edge, both the community and the teachers. Every day now, and this is very disheartening, I get emails from other union presidents around the island asking, actually begging, that they have teachers who are getting laid off. Many years, kids love these teachers, and now they're getting laid off. They have this phenomenal math teacher. Does anybody know, is anyone hiring a math? Right? Laid off because of bad financial planning. Right? We need to recognize all the great things that have happened in Plain Edge and, and the people who have made that happen. Board of Ed, Dr. Selena's administrative team. Things are amazing here. We are not looking to excess teachers. Remember, when you lay off teachers, that hurts programs, that hurts kids, right? Their favorite teacher is gone, but maybe even worse, maybe the program that the teacher was running is also now gone too. Limited opportunity for students, very disappointing. And if this is real, this is not, I mean, I, I'm happy to show people the emails that I get. I just got one today. Eight teachers being laid off in a district. Hey, does anybody have any room for these teachers? They're phenomenal educators. So Dr. Selena, I thank you for all you've done for the past 13 years. We're not laying off teachers today. And the kids next year will have their favorite teachers still a year. And I can't say the same about many other districts in this community. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Hello, Joe Garcia, how are you? Uh, question for about UPK. Uh, I think we did get into the wait list. Is there any idea if the rest of those kids have a chance of getting seated or is that pretty much at this point a done deal? No, it's not a done deal. We continue to review the numbers. Uh, kindergarten registration is ongoing. Um, should there be the availability of additional space, we will definitely fill additional seats. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we hear about is like, okay, here's the capital plan. You guys kind of adopted it, budget's going forward. But that happened all for public comment, right? So it does feel like, hey, there's no chance to come up here and talk a little bit because this is already now going to go to the to the <clears throat> budget vote. We all want the budget to pass. It's a good budget. We don't want to deal with what those other districts are dealing with. As far as the time for the superintendent comments, I wish we had spent that much time <laughs> in the interactions with board members that have occurred over the years. I think looking at online comments, getting so upset about them, we hear about all the great stuff here in these meetings. There's a lot of great stuff here in Plain Edge, but every day those teachers will go home, just like me as a business person, and think about what could be better. So instead of wishing away the bad comments, where is that coming from? What could be better? We don't hear about why are our graduation rates not so great. We don't hear about what we think of the test scores, right? We hear about how great everything is, but not always what could be better. Every day, please ask, how can we get better? Thanks. Thank you. Andy Rothstein, um, I know many people here tonight. Uh, I'm second generation Plain Edge. Mm -hmm. My kids are third generation Plain Edge. And I've got to tell you, I have to agree with the board and Dr. Selena. Mm -hmm. You can't lead with the negative. You can't lead with what people can hide behind Facebook and everything what is, they want to say about, about the negative. This district is second to none. In my other career, I deal with 13 to 14 school districts. They all look at Plain Edge as the leader. This is what we do. It's no uh, coincidence that our home prices are what they are. The value of our homes have gone up so much more than other districts in other areas because of this school district. People want to come into this school district for that reason. And I've got to tell you, again, I've been here 50 years. I've been through everything from school budgets not being passed, the community getting together <clears throat> to build sports programs, everything along those lines. We are in such a great place right now. And personally, as a resident of the Tampa Oyster Bay, as a former uh, student of Plain Edge, my kids went to Plain Edge, I resent the fact that people hide behind Facebook and everything else with these negative comments. Come up to these meetings, say something, but you can't hide behind everything on those lines. I hear all the buzzwords, all the buzzwords that go back and forth when we have elections buzz about transparency and we need change. Change for the sake of change means absolutely nothing. Everybody comes up with, we're going to change this, we're going to change that. What do we need to change? When look at the district, look at the ratings of our district. So again, 
If I sound passionate about this, I am. We have one of the best districts. I want to thank all the school teachers, all of the teachers that, that spend so much time with our kids. Whether or not they're being paid or not, it makes no difference because I've never seen one teacher in Plain Edge that hasn't volunteered for a program, that hasn't volunteered for Special Olympics or anything along those lines. And then we have people on Facebook hiding behind it with negative comments. I, I just think it's disgusting. And I just wanted to make sure that, that, that you all hear that the board hears, that the teachers hear, that the majority, the majority of people that live in this district are thrilled to live in this district. And one more point I'll make is you've got 60 to 70 percent of people who live in this district, they don't even have kids in the school anymore, but they're staying. They're not just staying for the, for the value of their homes. They're staying for what this district represents. They're also staying for all of the programs that are offered because of this board and what we do. <clears throat> all of the adult education programs that keep exploding. Every time I hear about pickleball, uh -huh. there's more classes being added uh -huh. because that's what people want. The fact that we're going to have a gym that the community can use. And I understand your point as far as with security and the importance of security, but as long as it's done properly, and it seems to me that this district is doing security properly, it's a great opportunity for seniors. It's a great opportunity for people like me. My kids are gone. My kids are out of this district. There's a reason for me to be here. So I just wanted to thank the board. I wanted to thank Dr. Selena, obviously the teachers for everything that you've done. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, Michael Morrissey. Four, uh, bought our first house here in Plain Edge. Proud of Plain Edge. I spend what little free time I have uh, volunteering my time around Plain Edge uh, coaching. Uh, I just wanted to see if we could shed a little insight on the district's planning moving forward. Regards, I know uh, Mr. Perazzo talked about a lot of all the ifs and ands of uh, the state budgeting process and having spent years on the uh, this, you know, the, the district side of negotiating those budgets and you would, you would want to go into what it takes to negotiate mm -hmm. and control uh, for the city. Um, but, you know, obviously the budget's delayed. We're not getting anything until at least Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, so you really don't know. Yeah. What it is. And the governor had proposed two changes to the foundation aid formula, uh, which makes up about 60% of all the state aid and just about less than 40% of uh, most districts' budgets. Mm -hmm. Um, she delayed those proposed changes for a couple of years. You know, we've seen, as Mr. Hughes mentioned, districts across the island that have been ravaged or, you know, facing potential ravaging uh, by these drops in, uh, in state aid. I was just wondering what steps this district is taking to for comparisons. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Long Island, Lower Hudson Valley, Upper Hudson Valley, you know, the two big parts of foundation aid, what it costs to educate a student, the district's ability to pay. Uh, that that cost. No, if you could just share a little insight on, you know, what we're doing to prepare ourselves. I think I think the presentation speaks for itself that we received earlier as far as planning for the future in the rainy days. Typically answer questions, but I'll respond tonight. Um, the fact of the matter is that regardless of what the governor does at this point in time, she's a politician. I've been in this business for over thirty five years. I've been listening to politicians my entire life. They've been threatening communities like ours with reductions inside of uh, public education. Public education has been under attack in many different ways throughout uh, the entire country. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we're ready for those rainy days uh, when that happens with our reserves and our current allocations. So while the other people are scrambling and they're concerned about whether they're gonna be able to afford to keep 50 teachers or 100 teachers that they just basically gave notice to, we're actually increasing staff at this point in time for programs that are, have meaningful effects uh, for students' lives. So we do have the reserves stationed at this point in time, should there be an emergency situation that we need to deal with. But no one knows what the government is going to do. But remember, when you're a politician, the only thing you're really interested in is winning what you want. So we'll find out what the governor gets real soon, uh, and we'll be ready for it. <clears throat> Any additional questions at this time? Yes, yes sir. <clears throat> Oh, it's my first time. My name is Michael Chiafalo. I've lived here since 1967. 
I'm the youngest of five Chufalos that have gone to Plainage. Anyone that's been around? Uh, my oldest brother went to Bolvin Drive, if you can imagine. Good packing. Uh, I'm here. Bailey, uh, who won the show? I think you guys are doing a great job. And that is, uh, I'm, I don't tolerate that kind of crap either. It, it speaks volumes what you do. You got a great town. Sports are great. My dad was one of the men that built that shack on John and West, mm -hmm. the football, down okay. to the Bobcats okay. and Stevens. Uh, I'm here for one reason. It's the Board of Education. My son, <clears throat> uh, Logan, don't do the math. Um, he's in <laughs> first grade. Uh, and we went for our CSE meeting on uh, February 14th. And now he's been classified. Now, I had dyslexia. And in second grade, at East Plain, it's the same building, I was left back. At that time, they didn't know how to deal with dyslexia. And they sent me to Elmont, Gotham Avenue, for one year. Fifty years later, my son has now been, uh, excuse me, I don't know the terminology, but uh, ICP or IEP. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, he goes to East Plain. Mm -hmm. He's been with the same crew of friends for now, it will be six years, because they said, now, I know we're funded to 2025 with the, with the programs, and these teachers are great. My son and other kids, and I know there's been an uptick in kids that need extra help, resource rooms, et cetera. I've been told that Schwarden and John H. West are the only facilities that can accommodate. That's very unfortunate to hear because when you have dyslexia or you have a learning disability, you could feel it with the other kids. You know you don't fit. That's, that's hard for kids. We put a lot of programs, we've got workshops to deal with this. We're putting a lot into education. Now, I'm all for the sports, and anyone that knows my family will tell you, we're big into the sports. Mm -hmm. But this is important. We want to take a kid that, who has been for six years, five years, with his peers. You're taking him out of the school and putting him into a resource room at John H. West or Schwartz. That's hard. The psychological impact in that alone is devastating. We should be able to have the capabilities to have those services at East Plain. The teachers, I don't know what the capita per student, per teacher, I don't know what that <laughs> looks like. I really don't. Uh, but I'm going to come here every board meeting. I'm going to fight for my son. Sure. I'm going to fight. As I've done my little bit of research, I found that there's been a big uptick at East Plain and the other schools. Kids that had gone through that. Uh, it's, it's traumatizing for the children. And this, all this stuff that we're doing is great, and I love it. Uh, sports, tennis courts, all of that's great. But the main focus uh, of the Board of Education is education, doing the right things for the kids first. The teachers, I know it's a strain on them. They have to now try to, so any kids that don't have any issues, that's fine. Uh, but the teachers have to now be occupied <coughs> taking care of the kids like my son, who's, who's getting better with the extra help that he's getting, because the teachers are amazing. All, all, I've got nothing bad to say about anyone on the board or on the school mission. Very proud to still live here. Uh, my second son, my son graduated in 2013. Logan, uh, I got remarried and I have another kind of calculated. I need Netflix and that's all I'm with. Uh -huh. 2025, we either need to start doing some more for uh, East Plain, throw another roof on there like you did with. Uh, with Shorten and John H. West, whatever you got to do, the population is growing. I've lived in the same house. I bought the one across the street, but I'm back in that house. Uh, since 1964, my family's lived there. It's this, there's got to be six new families with all six, with all children. <clears throat> Population's growing in the school, school district. They shouldn't have to be kicked out of East Plain to get that extra resources in John H. West. And again, keep in mind uh, the psychological impact that has on these children. When you take them out of the school, at least they know that they don't feel right. They know they don't, they're not fitting in. You're taking them out of that class, at least in grade, they get to be. My son, instead of going to the playground, go reading. I'm all for that. He's got to deal with that. That's part. Uh, but he'll get, at some point at lunch, to play with his friends. Now you want to take him out of that scenery, bring him to Johnny Trust, to a resource room, where he doesn't know any of the other kids. Where six years of kids at uh, St. Gregory's and the pre-school kid. He lost half a year because of COVID. So I know there's a lot of psychological issues out there pertaining to our children. Uh, just, I want this board to take, I don't know if it's a motion, what you got to do, but I want you to please dig deep into your budget. If it's adding more teachers, I know it's funded to 25, so we're kind of 
just starting. I'm just diving into this. I did a lot of political work in my last career. I know how to do it. I'm just learning all this. I tried printing it, by the way. So if you guys were wondering who the security threat was, I tried to print this so I could just do it myself. That was me. Uh, I got kicked off immediately. But uh, I am a, a supporter of you guys. I'm going to help you support it. But when I see the 1.9, I'll be glad to pay. I just need your help. I'm committed to not only my son, other parents, and there's a few parents that will come with me today. Uh, I think there's a gentleman here that has a, a daughter as well. We got to fight for these kids. That's the Board of Education. I thank you for all you do. Thank I'll, you, sir. I'll see you next. Thank you. What is the next one? May 7th. May 7th. May 7th. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Farber. My family has been here for four generations. I've, they lived in the same house for so long that East Queen wasn't even built. In the forest. <clears throat> my grandparents used to tell stories that they were worried that my mother would get lost in the forest. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been here a while. And my daughter is going to East Queen now. And to have the knowledge that she has to go somewhere else because for what reason? I don't really know. It, it seems silly. It seems like it's a easy pass just to do inclusion classes in East Plain. I did the math on it. Her current class size with one teacher, she gets three minutes of undivided attention per period. That's not that great, even if she didn't have her special needs. And like the other gentleman said, to throw her into a new environment where she doesn't know anyone and she has her disabilities, that's a tough sell. But I would want inclusion classes in East Plain. That would be the first step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any additional questions or statements, I should say, comments? Okay. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Ms. Townsend, do I have a second? Dr. Neto, all in favor? Opposed. Yes, six in favor, motion passed. Thank you.